With Formula 1 cars having near identical shapes to the casual eye, the immediate distinction between them is their livery, the colour scheme and design that adorns their shapes from nose to tail. A team's livery has to be a number of things all at once. A style, an insignia, an identity, and yes, a 200 mile an hour billboard. Such is the expensive nature of Formula One. How do F1 cars achieve, or fail at, all of this, and what considerations go into designing the livery of a Formula One car? Let's have a look. From initial concepts to a finished product, Formula One liveries can take a long time to conceive, sometimes as long as six months, with tens of ideas first hitting the drawing boards slowly being whittled down and honed into the colours we see at launch. And this is true even with liveries that seem not to change much year on year, like with Mercedes or Ferrari. Initial concepts will be drawn onto 2D projections, that is, templates of the car from side on, above, or even head on to gain a feel for the idea you're going for. This isn't really enough to go with though, so some of the better ideas are then painted, for want of a better word, onto 3D digital models that can be twisted and turned in all directions. It may turn out that the design that looked good on a flat template kind of falls apart at certain angles or loses some of the essence you were going for. Renault, with their most recent livery, have really leaned into the idea that a livery takes on different forms from different angles, with a car that looks completely yellow from the front, almost completely black from the side, and with the full picture only coming together from a shifted perspective. Working in digital space also allows designers to drop the 3D model into different environments, on track, against different backgrounds, even in different lighting conditions that come with bright sunshine, heavy cloud, dusk, nighttime, or even a spotlit stage at a car launch or event. The liveries are then continually tweaked as the new model of car is developed by the team. Surfaces of F1 cars can get very complex, and the liveries' flowing lines, areas of colour and logos may find themselves in awkward areas if the designers add a winglet here, a bump there, a hole in the engine cover, etc etc. The exact nature of the design may change several times to accommodate changes to the shape of the chassis, even during the season. In terms of the way the design points of the livery are put together, you'll find designers work from a position of using the lines of the bodywork, or the sense of the airflow along the body of the car as a reference point. From here you can block out patterns that go along these lines or deliberately cross them. Among this year's cars you can see Mercedes and Williams stripes following the lines of imagined airflow which is common these days, with Toro Rosso going a bit more old school with their horizontal stripe, a style shown admirably on the 1997 Minardi back when chassis were a little more boxy anyway. In terms of cutting across lines of bodywork you'll sometimes see this on the nose to break up space for sponsors, but occasionally on the full body too. The classic McLaren Marlboro design features shapes that deliberately and aggressively cross the lines of bodywork, but it works both because the lines cut almost perpendicularly to the line of the engine cover, balancing it out, and because the upward stripe plays into the idea that the car is being pulled forward from beneath, skewing it across the top. And this is the same trick of the eye that the current and next generation of F1 car shapes pull, skewing back the wings and body shapes to make it look fast. You have to be incredibly careful picking how to cross the flow of bodywork with your colour blocks. Force India have a pretty solid 2018 livery, but these stripes at the back look clunky as their direction really doesn't fit with what's being suggested by the car's shape. It makes the back end look saggy and badly balanced design-wise. Of course a huge part of your livery design is the colour scheme, and this is something that ends up being a lot trickier for teams than you might think. See, your colour scheme and style is part of your bigger branding. Brand isn't necessarily a bad, cold, corporate thing that's just about marketing and logos. Brand is just a reflection of your team's identity, and that's not just going to be displayed on your cars, but on your uniforms, your trucks, your press releases, and your merchandise. If you want fans to wear your gear, you want it to feel very much like what your team is about. Ferrari cap should feel Ferrari. Renault shirt should feel Renault. When McLaren shifted from a long period of greys, silvers, and blacks to a brighter orange colour scheme, that wasn't just about a move away from Mercedes. That was the team moving from its deliberate clinical corporate personality to one that's more full of life and the spirit of its old school racing heritage. A colour scheme might also be determined by agreements with a title sponsor, as most evidenced by the current Williams and Force India cars who are completely decked out in Martini and BWT branding respectively. Having a livery determined by the title sponsor will mean some negotiation with your other sponsors to ensure they are conspicuous and aren't overshadowed as may be your worry if your logo is stuck onto what essentially is a massive BWT billboard. But just because your livery isn't branded by your sponsor, that doesn't mean you don't have to negotiate with your sponsors on the final design. After all, they're paying a lot of money to sit on the car and expect a certain size and prominence. Any important text or logos need to be visible as agreed in terms of the space they are given on the cars, which means colour-wise designs need to be careful about those mid-tones. A light logo can be placed on a dark background, and a dark logo should be placed against a light background. Mid-tones can get a bit tricky. 
If we look at the Mercedes livery with its unique fade from bright silver to dark grey, we see how the white logos are placed in the dark areas, and how the dark logos are placed in the bright areas. Where logos may straddle the midtones, they are given contrasting border to ensure they aren't lost. Before they mastered the fade effect, Mercedes liveries were a lot less effective as they struggled with the midtones. Their 2011 effort kept the engine cover matte silver, which left sponsors a little bit lost, while their first livery in 2010 used an oily streak of black on the engine cover and a black Patronus logo in a very messy attempt to work around the silver brand colour. McLaren is another example. Their choice of orange in 2017 was a tricky tone to contrast against, and neither the white nor the black stood out particularly well against this backing. The lighter papaya orange used for 2018 was a much better canvas for its sponsors and insignia. Nowadays, quite a lot of the teams have moved in the direction of convincing their sponsors to work within their colour scheme. So instead of having to worry about balancing logos of many different colours across your livery, you pick colours that contrast well together and render all your sponsor logos in that colour. Lotus managed this with their black and gold livery, though Total would not give up their red branding, so Lotus adopted it as an accent colour in a slightly clumsier than ideal solution. Ferrari, on the other hand, have chosen in general to use sponsor logos as they come, which ends up, arguably, in a slightly messy array of advertisements down the body of their car. And it's not just the sponsors you've got to worry about disappearing. The livery as a whole has got to make the car unique and distinct on track. Darker colours, particularly greys and blacks, can result in the cars being difficult to make out on track, particularly on bright days where the track is bright and reflective and the background is illuminated. In close-up, the lighter sponsor logos and accents will pop, but at a distance the car is more likely to fall into complete silhouette, as the camera will balance out the brightness of the overall image by making darker colours darker. It's also all too easy to create a livery that will look almost identical to another team's car on track. Now on paper and at launch events, the Williams and Sauber cars look very different. Unfortunately, a huge amount of the TV footage is shot face-on, zoomed in, down a long straight. And from the front, with that kind of TV shot, the Sauber and the Williams with their white noses and thin dark stripes are indistinguishable at first glance. Midland F1 and McLaren often had the same problem back in 2006. The problem of standing out and keeping a unique identity is the kind of thing that can be resolved with the clever use of accent colours, colouring the tip of the nose, giving the rear wing a colour tone that stands out, something like that. And sometimes teams will make changes like this mid-season in order to distinguish themselves from a similar looking car. In this image we can see this year's pack of cars have done a mostly good job at creating unique liveries that are easily distinguishable. But the Williams and Salbers need a bit of a squint and a think to tell them apart, and in this still image they're not even moving. Finally, it's important to remember that paint is a physical substance. Not only does it have weight, a classic bugbear in Formula 1, but different colours and paint types have different weights. For example, lighter colours require thicker coats than darker colours, so a white paint job might be twice as heavy as an equivalent black livery. Different finishes also weigh different amounts. That McLaren iconic chrome paint was notorious for being heavier than regular paint, and a lot of work was put in for years to get its density down. Remember also that stripes, accents and other blocks of colours are layered on top of the base colour and a lot of work goes into keeping these extra layers of paint as smooth and flush with the base as possible so as not to disturb the aerodynamic flow of the bodywork. In this regard, paint is also used to smooth over joins where pieces of bodywork meet to reduce the effect of the big old seam in someone's nicely designed chassis. This is why the cars are constantly buffed and polished across the weekend, not just to keep the logos all shiny, but to keep the surfaces smooth and working as designed. So from initial scribblings on a simple template, to giving the stripes a good old shine on race day, a heck of a lot of work goes into a car's livery. Sometimes fans despair when liveries lack imagination or bravery, and often rightly so. But there's a whole lot of competing interest to balance in making a livery that works for your team. Sometimes it's best to take the Williams approach and change your whole scheme every time you change partners. Sometimes it's best to pick a team colour and run with it, come hell or high water like Ferrari. But the good thing for fans is that we've currently got one of the most colourful grids in years. Okay, so remember how I was going to do Q&As at the end of these? Yeah, I forgot. Oops. Let's have another go. Question 1. Hiko Chumbo asks, is there the only one who found 2012's aquiline nosed cars gorgeous? And the answer is yes, you are definitely the only one. He ego chimbo, love is blind. Question two, am I a Chelsea fan? Uh, no, Thando, I'm not. I'm not even a football fan. I just use Chelsea and Man U images in the concepts video as they'd be easily identifiable. I've had a lot of people asking what this credits music is. Um, it's called Chess Moves by Telegrams. It's on their eponymous album, uh, Telegrams, which I think is on iTunes and Spotify and all that stuff. 
Question four, can we have a follow-up on the hands device? Yes, this is in response to my helmets video. Um, I had originally included a section on the hands, but decided to scrap it in interest of time and instead use it in future video on car safety systems, which will happen at some point. Uh, and finally, a lot of people have asked why a lot of my videos appear on Autosport as well as here. Uh, this is a part of a deal I had with motorsport.com who basically helped fund this channel and allow me to make the videos I want to make regularly. Uh, what they get out of me is a video at least once per race, so I'll still continue to make videos exclusively for this channel that don't appear elsewhere, but there will be still be regular double ups across both channels until at least the spring. And honestly, you know, watch the video wherever you prefer. Uh, I'll try and include Q&As in the ones on this channel. Uh, please do say subscribe to this channel though, as there will be extra videos here, both the, you know, the last week in F1 and bingo style videos, but also full explainer videos, just like the 2021 concepts analysis, which only appeared on this channel. Um, honestly, cheers for your patience, and I hope you continue to enjoy all of my work. Uh, you've been amazing.